Now, I must confess, I'm standing here before you today as a sinner saved by grace, but actually, it's a pretty good place to be. So my hope and prayer is that you too are a sinner saved by grace. How many sinners we have saved by grace? Okay, because it tells me that you've just made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life and you've accepted his free gift of salvation. So today, my title of my sermon is The Truth About Sin. Now, if it's true, where's it going to come from? It's going to come from the Bible. Because everybody has their own opinions, which don't amount to a hill of beans, right? We're worried about what the Bible says. So I'm praying that God will give each of us spiritual eyes to have and open our ears to the truth about sin. Because our correct understanding of sin can make all the difference in the world between life and death. Now, many years ago, anybody remember Pastor Joe Cruz? All right. He wrote a book entitled Creeping Compromise. Great book, right? Today, if he were alive, I'd probably ask him, or he probably on his own would be changing the title of that book. It may have to be changed to something like Full Out Compromise or In Your Face Compromise or <laughs> something like that, right? Okay, at last fall's camp meeting, my sermon was about Satan's attack on the remnant church. For those of you at home, I'm gonna take a little second to go back, and this is kind of a, folks here, it's kind of a continuation, but I wanna talk to the folks at home too. And um, so what, it's about Satan's attack on the remnant church of God and how progressive sin really is. So today, my sermon will focus on some of the incredible deceptions that Satan is using to divide and destroy the Christian church. And sadly, our church is no exception. Oh, you got quiet on that. All right, that's okay. I must briefly cover the definition of sin and its consequences so our viewers and listeners around the world will be able to follow the rest of the sermon. So, we're going to allow the Bible to settle some very important and relevant questions, plaguing the church concerning the difference between open sin and repented of sin. Now, you're going to hear that several times. There is a difference, and I think if we can get this point across today through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I've asked God to let him hear what you need to hear, not what I say. So if you're open today to the Holy Spirit, you'll hear the truth regardless of what I say because the Holy Spirit is taking over, so please don't look at me. When you look at me, you say, he looks older than I thought he was. He looks shorter than I thought he was, and uh, he looks better on TV. That's the kind of thing. That's in the physical. We don't, we don't want to do that today, right? We want to deal in the spiritual. So let's get started. If we want to find out about sin, let's turn to Romans 3, 23. It'll come up on the screen. So I'm going to go pretty quickly. If you got your Bibles, we'll give you a little chance to stay with us. But we've got to roll today. So here we go. Romans 3, 23 says, you say it with me. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God of God. How many? All. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, no one is perfect. Sorry to bust your bubbles. Thus, no one is exempt. Right? The devil has succeeded in de deceiving literally many in the church when it comes to the truth about sin and its consequences. It seems for many, sin is determined by today's culture and politics. You probably can guess, right? Okay. <laughs> In fact, the Ten Commandments have taken a back seat to many in the church as they've made social justice their new religion. Yeah. Then there are those who are either afraid to call sin by its right name for fear of the woke cancel culture group or, have you ever heard that term? Or have been deceived into relig the religion of inclusion, diversity, race, equity, and so on. Now these are new terms we probably didn't hear five or ten years ago. We must not lose focus that the devil's goal is to divide the church of God on this earth. If the church is divided by culture and politics, then it will also be divided as to what constitutes sin. So, let's talk a little more about sin. If we allow, allow the Bible to be our guide, it's not all that difficult to determine what sin is and how it affects everyone ever born on this earth. Now, I want to say right off the bat, again, it's not my intention really to offend anyone. But as a Christian, I have to love people enough to tell them the truth. And so do you, right? I realize this may not be a popular message to some of you, but if we are a last day remnant church, we cannot bow to present culture or politics. 
In other words, we cannot, as a church, affirm, listen closely to this word. You're going to hear it several times today. And it's not by accident or because I didn't realize I'm being repetitious. This word, what, what word? Affirm. affirm. Okay. We cannot, as a church, affirm or accept in the membership any person or group of people who in, are in open rebellion to the Ten Commandment law of God. Amen. All right. You still with me? Yeah. All right. In other words, they can't bring their junk into our house. Is that fair enough? I don't know where that came from, but it's, it came from somewhere. All right. I'll try to make this simple now. If the Christian church, by design, in fact, I can say this with, with authority because I get it from the Bible. The Christian church, by design, is not an all-inclusive group. Well, some people, see, some of you with me and some of you still thinking about it. It's not an all-inclusive group. No, it isn't. See, that's not popular in today's message. Wait, wait a minute. We're, don't we love everybody? Don't, aren't we supposed to, you know, all, no, no, listen to me. No, it isn't. As Christians, we're to live by the spiritual laws, which often conflict with the physical laws set up by man, right? Sure. Now, here's the problem. Present politics and culture headed by the woke cancel culture group is aggressively lobbying to, forget, to convince the Christian church to affirm everyone. Otherwise, they accuse us of being bigots and hypocrites and racist and, you know, some of the other objectionable names. So let me clear this up. This should clear this up. If Jesus were on earth today, he would be the target of the same woke cancel culture group that you and me are. Why? Because they would accuse him of not being inclusive. Are you with me now? Okay. He preached about, the fact is, Jesus preached about a very non-inclusive heaven. Whoa, that doesn't sound very good today, but he did. Right? Jesus preached about, in fact, a heaven that does not include or affirm anyone who refuses to admit that they are sinners and accept his free gift of salvation. Yeah. Folks, it's important that you understand this. Let's read it. Turn with me quickly to Ephesians 6, 12. It's up on the screen here in just a moment, I think. It's already up there. Good job. All right, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So if we're not prayed through, Satan will get us caught up in the physical. Simple enough to understand, right? Instead of the spiritual. So as Christians, we have to base our beliefs on the Word of God, which is spiritual. Now, we only get sidetracked by the devil when he can tempt us to get caught up in our emotions. Think about that. If we just stick with the Bible, it's really pretty easy. Everybody agree with that? But the scriptures are plain. God's word never, God's word never, God's word never changes. You knew what I was going to say, didn't you? God's word never changes. Keep that in mind today. We have to keep that Okay, that's in Malachi 3, 6. It's short, but we'll go for it. For I am the Lord, I change not. Oh, he put not at the end of it. For I am the Lord, I change not. Now, to me, it seems like each generation is getting farther and farther away from God and his word. This generation literally is looking more and more like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, if we take our, our eyes off of God and his Ten Commandments, folks, we will end up just like Lot's wife. Do you remember what happened, anybody, to Lot's wife? I do. She turned into, thank you, she turned into a pillar of salt. All because she let her emotions, right, the physical, she took her eyes off of Jesus. Now, as we get a little farther into this sermon, you're going to find out that the principles of what I'm talking about are actually easy to understand as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace, right? So keep in mind, the devil does not have the power to deceive us. We're only deceived when we take our eyes off of Jesus. Now, I quoted this, deception is a choice. Think about it, deception is a choice. In fact, 
I thought it was so good, I said, I think I'll coin this phrase. I said, Yvonne, I think I'll coin this phrase, deception is a choice. Maybe we get it on a t-shirt or something. She said, honey, you got that from my last speech that I gave to somewhere she was at. <laughs> she said, I already used that. I said, well, it must have worked because I already had it down here. I'm like, okay, all right, well, okay. Now back to inclusion. Okay, as I was saying, Jesus would flunk the woke cancel culture society of today because he spoke of a very non-inclusive heaven. Now, let's read about it. everything I'm saying today. Please don't get upset because I'm giving scriptures. I'm going to give scriptures to back exactly what I'm saying up here. Let's go to Matthew 7. We'll read verses 13 and 14. Okay, let's do it. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and how many? Many be there which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and a lot there will enter in. Oh no, sorry, you're listening. Okay, you're listening. So few be there that enter in. Well, how can that be if everything's so inclusive? I mean, when we start reading this Bible, wait a minute, is that true? Well, it doesn't sound like it. So, as a church, we're faced with a big problem. Do we deny church membership to those living in open sin and rebellion to God's law? Or do we compromise with present culture and politics? Now, if so, then we do away with the sin factor altogether. Plus, then we would have to affirm everyone into church membership. So, we'd be ordaining them as deacons and elders and pastors. Think about this. This would mean we must affirm open pedophiles. They got quiet murderers, thieves, rapists, drug pushers, wife beaters. Nowadays you hear it the opposite way too. So spouse beaters, all right, if we want to be now be politically correct, spouse beaters. Well, okay, the truth is the church has, listen to this closely, the church has no authority from God to affirm sin. Now, if you don't hear anything else I said today, listen to that closely. The church of God on this earth has no authority from God to affirm, there's that word again, right? To affirm open sin. So if you're not sure, we're going to talk about that. We're going to find out about open sin and what we might call status quo sin, okay? We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. But let's read Jesus' inspired words once again. Where am I going to? I'm going to the Bible, okay? 1 John 3, 4. Give you a second to get to it. And if you don't have it, you can look right up on the screen again. For those of you at home, hopefully it's right on your, your television set. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, there's nothing hard about that to understand, is there? I mean, really, is that hard to understand? Aren't you glad you don't have to be a neurosurgeon like some people in our audience today? <laughs> you know, no, you don't have to be that to understand this. For sin is the transgression of the law. What law? My law? God's law. Got it. So according to the Bible, sin is the breaking of God's Ten Commandment law. Now, I'm telling you, it seems that we all have different opinions have you ever noticed that? You can talk to people of other denominations, Christians, and even within our own, and we all have our own opinions of what constitutes sin. But guess what? The scripture clears this all up. If we break the Ten Commandment law by our thoughts and actions, I added that because it's very important, our thoughts and our actions, we're guilty of sin. Okay, now let's walk it down a little bit. Again, this is very simple. If we keep our emotions out of it, just listen to what God has to say. So, now we should ask, what's the consequences of breaking God's Ten Commandment law? Now, for that answer, guess where we're going back to? The Bible, and back to Romans. Okay, it's Romans 6, 23. If you're ready, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise the Lord for the plan of salvation. I hear an amen on that? Amen. I mean, that is incredible that the Son of God would look down to us and see anything worth saving. Wow. Okay. 
Now let's keep going. I've got to keep my time going here. Okay, how do we turn sin and its consequences into eternal life instead of eternal death? For that answer, we're going back to the Bible. This is not a thus said, Danny, back to the Bible. We're going to go to 1 John 1, verses 8 to 10. Now usually when we ask that question, that question we go to 1, 1 John 1, 9. You said it. Somebody's there. But it's really important we read this scripture before and the one after today as we're following through with sin. So here we go. First John, you ready? Here we go. If we say that we know sin, we deceive, we what? We do what? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Oh, that's, that's straightforward. Now, nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. Sorry, thank you, sorry. All unrighteousness. That's a lot, big meaning for a little word, isn't it? If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, who's him? We make him, God, Jesus, a liar, and his word is not in us. Now that's strong stuff, folks. Strong stuff. People say, oh, well, don't judge. You don't judge. You don't know. We're going to get into that. I can't wait till we get into just a little bit farther. We're going to talk about judging, yeah. right? You hear that a lot. Don't judge, no matter what. Don't judge. Well, as Christians, do we have a right to judge or don't we? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see what, we'll see what God says. I'm excited about this. It's going, to, it's, it's going to get gooder and gooder, all right? Okay. <laughs> Now, based on what we've just read, as sinners, we must confess our sins to Jesus. Then at this point, our sins fall into just two categories, confessed and unconfessed, right? So according to the Bible, this tells us that confession, repentance of our sins to Jesus equals forgiveness. Isn't that great? It's a simple equation. All right. So now we end up with the fact that our sins are either in the forgiven category or the unforgiven category, right? Say it with me. The unforgiven category. Okay, if we openly sin, now listen closely, which is rebelling against God's Ten Commandment law, we will reap the wages of our unconfessed, unforgiven sins. I hope this is making sense now and you're tracking with me. For our viewers at home, I'm going to come back to you here for a moment. I must insert here that the Ten Commandments, law of God, was not nailed to the cross. It was the Mosaic law that was nailed to the cross. You know, a lot of people say, well, 3A is a great channel. You know, you're reaching a, a, lot of, a lot of Adventist people. I have to tell you that approximately 99% of all of our potential viewers around the world are not Seventh-day Adventists. No. Just Dish Network alone, with millions and millions of viewers, how many Seventh-day Adventists have Dish Network? A few hundred thousand? There's millions, thousands of cable companies. The Roku's, the Verizon, and all of these, I don't want to get in the start, but all of these people that we're reaching. So for those of you, some of you here, you know what I'm talking about, so bear with me while we talk to our viewers at home a second. The Mosaic Law was nailed to the cross. Now, I don't have time to go into it today, but you can order a free book from 3ABN entitled, The Truth About the Ten Commandments. The truth about, we keep using that word truth, don't we? The truth about the Ten Commandments. You can get that from 3ABN free. Now indeed, the Ten Commandment law of God, if it were nailed to the cross, I want you to think about this, then there would be no sin. Because we already read sin's the transgression of the law. Everybody with me? So. If there is no sin, there's no need of a Savior. And if there's no need of a Savior, then there's no need of churches or pastors. Right? So God's law is a transcript of His own character, and His love is the foundation that heaven is built upon. So all of this said and read, I believe that every, literally everyone has a right to believe, now listen to this, anything they want to about sin. I'm going to pause a second. You agree with that? I think everybody has a right. Thanks for helping me. Everyone has a right to feel how they want to about sin. And they have a right to live their lives 
how they want to, all without my or your permission, by the way. Is that right? That's called freedom of choice, right? The freedom to live in open sin as long as, there's always these little pauses, right? As, as long as no earthly laws are broken. But that all changes when their goal is to bring their ungodly lifestyle into the church. Yeah. Open rebellion to God's law cannot be affirmed, there's that word again, as compatible with Christian values. Amen. Right? Yeah. I'm afraid I'm losing some of you. No, Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, is when the church must rise up and be counted. This is the time. Why? Because everything that's happening in the church today affects our children, our homes, our schools, and us individually. When others try to force their unchristian views on us, we must stand up and be counted. Amen. We're to love everyone. I agree with that, right? And I wish I could do this love part as good as Dr. Ben did it last night. He, he, taught, he said dropped us some bombs and everybody loved it because he had so much love with it. Spiritual bombshells, I should say, right? And that's the way we do. We have, the message is no good without love because Jesus is love, right? Amen. God is love. Now, we serve God and Him alone. So, what I'm saying here is that we cannot allow false doctrine to enter into our ranks. As Christians, we cannot compromise God's law to please people. And yes, what I'm about to say in love, I'm emphasizing that, must keep in mind that our enemy is not the not people. Who's our enemy? Our enemy is the devil and the devil alone. And part of the straight testimony, folks, is loving people enough to tell them the truth and risking the chance that you might offend them. So today, I must say, this includes the LGBTQ community as well. Now, I know it's not popular in today's society, but for some reason, the Christian church has trouble labeling the LGBTQ lifestyle is a sin. Now, frankly, I don't know why. We as a church will label things like adultery is sin, right? If somebody says, what do you think about adultery? No matter what church, Christian church, they'll say, oh, that's a sin. Won't they? Yeah. Pedophilia, if I say pedophilia, does that sound like a sin? Yeah. Puts in that class, drugs and alcohol, tobacco. How about rape and murder? Yeah. Is that all sin? How about stealing and lying? That's all sin. And we have no placing, no problem placing those in the sin basket. But for some reason, it seems we cannot or will not place the LGBTQ community in the sin basket. I don't understand it. Folks, once again, the church cannot and must not bow to political correctness. I don't care how popular or politically correct it is, allegiance to race, culture, and politics is a road that will end in eternal death. If I'm giving too much to you, let me know, all right? Okay. As Christians, we are to love everyone, but we cannot affirm open, outright sin. Why not? I'm glad you asked. For the simple reason, we do not have the authority from God to do so. Oh, I should say that again. Because we do not have the authority to affirm outright, open, outright sin. Now, I'm going to throw you a spiritual bombshell. This is, this, is, this is a big one. Okay, everybody's got real quiet on me. <laughs> Listen closely. The Christian church cannot forgive sins, Catholic or Protestant. Amen. See, only God can forgive sins. Amen. So like God, the church should love sinners but hate the sin. Now, when we as a church, listen closely, affirm same-sex marriage, LGBTQ relationships, or any other, and I'm saying, or any other open sin, then we become followers of Satan instead of Christ. Amen. That's big. I mean, that's a big statement. Because we are attempting to stand in the place of God, forgiving sins. Amen. Plus, think about this. Even God does not forgive unconfessed sins. I mean, this is pretty deep. Hey, one of the identifying marks of the Antichrist spirit is a group who claims to forgive sin. Let's read about it. Don't take my word for it. Let's go to Mark 2, 5 to 7. All right? I'm going to go ahead and start. When you get there, you can join me if you want. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, Son, 
thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was a certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? So blasphemy against God, according to Mark 2, 5 to 7, is when humans, church or lady, claim to forgive sins. Right? Now, go Revelation 13, 5, really quickly. This is referring to the beast power. It says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, blasphemies we just read, is claimed to forgive sins. So even according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, Blasphemy is defined as, quote, the act of insulting or showing content or lack of reverence for God and or the act of claiming the attributes of a deity. Now, what's one of God's attributes? It's that he forgives sins, right? Now, we Seventh-day Adventists, we're really good to point to the Catholic Church and their openness to claim they have the authority to forgive sins. But the day that we as a church approve or endorse or affirm homosexual lifestyle or any other open sin, we too are guilty of claiming to forgive sins. Amen. Now listen closely, please. I'll say it again. God's church on this earth does not have the authority to forgive sins. Do you get it? We as sinful human beings cannot bless open sin. It's not in our, what do they call it? Pay grade. It's not in our pay grade, right? Now, I don't know how I can make this any plainer. Honestly, I don't. I mean, here, let me see if we <laughs> Remember, it was Satan that said, I shall be like the Most High God. It was Satan who said, I shall be like the Most High God. Satan's plan for the church of God on this earth is to represent him by attempting to forgive and affirm any and all unconfessed sins, which, by the way, would do away with sin completely. Think about that. That's deep. Now, I will say that probably a large majority of the LGBTQ community does not claim to be Christian. Now, they know that their lifestyle is contrary to the teachings of the Bible, and actually, I can respect that, right? As they have the freedom of choice to live how they want to live. Don't they? Yeah. Don't get quiet on me. But there's an ever-growing group of openly homosexual people who claim that they can live their lifestyle in open rebellion to the law of God and still claim it's compatible with the Christian walk. Is it? No. Not from what we just read, right? So right now, I'm not actually admonishing the LGBTQ group. You know who I'm admonishing? They have a right to believe their LGBTQ I had so many letters on that. I wish they'd shorten it. it it's, actually, it's actually politically correct to say queers, but I have a hard, because now they call themselves queer, and, and that's what that Q stands for. But as a kid growing up, that wasn't nice. So I'm not going to do that because I don't want to fall into that trap. So I'll just maybe say LGBT. I forget the Q. We all know what the Q stands for. Okay? They have the right to believe that their lifestyle is consistent with Christianity. Don't they? Now, how about this? It's not their fault that the church is affirming their error in theology. Now, brothers and sisters, we have to love them enough to tell them the truth. When we affirm their theology, it's just the opposite. We're patting them all the way to hell. Okay, go ahead. We, we don't want to offend you now. We'd rather you burn in fire and hell fire and be gone forever. I mean, really, if you think about it, and everybody's worried about fendin, offending someone now, not looking to the distance about eternal life. we got to get on the boat, folks. Now, we as a church also have a choice. They have a choice. We can either stand firm on the Word of God or compromise with the devil. The self-proclaimed LGBTQ community is very aggressive in their attempts to get the church to reinterpret scriptures. No, I'll show you in a minute. I'm not making that up. They want us to reinterpret scriptures, including like Romans chapter 1, so we can explain away the fact that God condemns homosexuality and same-sex marriage. So I think we should read Romans chapter 1. We're going to go with, start with, uh, let's start with verse 21. 
Okay, it'll give us a better understanding of what open sin is. Now I'm going to read this myself because it's pretty long, and you just follow with me on this. So it would take us a while to get through it, and I'm looking at this clock over here. Okay, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves." who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up into vile affections. Even their women did not change, did change the natural use, that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and, re and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir, which was me. Wow. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they wanted to forget about him, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled, get this, all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, natural, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, listen to this, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They enjoy watching you sin. They not only do it, they want you to be right there with them. Brothers and sisters, I mean, honestly, after reading that, does anyone still affirm that, still believe that God affirms people in their sins? No, he doesn't. God only affirms us when we ask him to forgive us from our sins, right? That's all. The push for the LGBTQ acceptance and affirmation in the SDA church is much more progressive than most of us realize. Now, let me explain to you how this progressive, this movement really is. I'm talking about within our church, not all these other churches, not out around the world. We need to understand this. We're not, again, we're not downplaying people. They have a right to do what they want to do and live the way they want to live, but they don't have the right to bring it into the church of God. We do not have the right or authority to accept it. By doing it, we're standing in the place of God, right? We can't forgive if it's sin and it's open, outright sin. We can't forgive it. And yet, somehow, our universities, our hospitals, people are buying into it big time. Now, I'm going to show you something. Here's an article written in 2012 where it shows La Sierra University would not affirm the LGBTQ, citing it would be against Adventist beliefs according to the Bible. That's good, right? That was 2012. Now let me fast forward to you to 2023. Not only did the university administration affirm, put it up on the screen, thank you, affirm LGBTQ, students, but gave them a special, special lavender graduation service, as they call it, this past Sabbath of, of all days, and in the church. Now, do you think this event went, unno went unnoticed by heaven? Can you imagine, in one of our schools, they had a special LGBTQ graduation, transgenders, the whole business, in the church on Sabbath. Now, our health system's already shown their acceptance and support publicly, including paving the way to the hiring of transgenders to serve in high positions in the SDA health system. Now, Pacific Union College, they openly affirm LGBTQ, and most of our colleges affirm LGBTQ clubs on campus. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think they would affirm an adulterer's club on campus? 
I mean, I've got to keep going back to this, folks, because we've got to say, where in the world is the common sense, right? Do you think that maybe they would affirm an alcoholics club on campus? No, you guessed it. I don't think so either. Now, I'm convinced that Seventh-day Adventists who are silent on these topics are just as guilty, just as guilty as the ones promoting it. Now, does all of this seem like a bad dream or nightmare to any of you besides me? I mean, it really does. I can't wrap my mind around the fact that people who know the Bible so well would willfully compromise their biblical beliefs because of government funding and accreditation. No, no, they're, no, they're not deceived, just compromised. Right? Can you imagine trying to explain all of this to God on Judgment Day, hoping that you get a heavenly pass? It's, it's not going to work. I'm sure some of you are still asking, okay, why is he so focused on the open sin in the LGBTQ community? And it's a very good question. All right? I'll answer that in a second, but let me first ask you, I'll ask you, can you think of any other organized group that's so powerful and influential that the U.S. government would change a number of their laws to appease them? And a group so powerful that the American Psychiatric Association would change their diagnosis from mental illness to complete affirmation, again, that word, without any science to back it. Now, come on. They always want to talk about science, right? All these organizations, but they don't want it when it comes to a, a boy's a boy and a girl's a girl and, and who can be a mother and all of this type of stuff, suddenly they want to throw science out the window. This community has also made tremendous roads into the Christian church, including the SDA church, while rebelling against the seventh commandment of the living God. The most powerful group that I know that is impacting the church big time today is the LGBTQ group. Now, let me be clear again, if they lived their lives separately without bringing their junk into the church and without us trying to, right? If they, let me say it again, I'm going to be kind about it. I started to say bring their junk, and I think I already did. I shouldn't probably say that. But bring their beliefs into the church and, and without trying to force their beliefs on the Christian church, I'd not be preaching this sermon. There'd be no need. People can live the way they want to live. We, it's not our job to judge them. We'll, we're going to get to that in just a minute. I'm more excited about that than the rest of the sermon so far. I'm still looking at the clock. I'm, I know what's going on here. Let me see the time. Okay. We got, we got a little while to go. Now, all of that said, they can march and protest and openly celebrate Pride Month. Someone said to me here at camp meeting, they give Mother's Day one day a year, they give Father's Day one day a year, and they give the pride, the LGBTQ, a whole month. They call it Pride Month. Well, let me ask you, where does the word pride come from? You're correct, right? And they can build a coalition of supporters and connect themselves with the civil rights movement, even influence our public schools to promote their ungodly agenda to our young children, as young as the second and third grades. I think we may have a picture. There's some books. Some of the, these are Christian books, Queerfully and Wonderfully Made, Happy Pride Month, Still Stacy. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of books that are now written by LGBTQ Christians who are promoting these into the churches. I'm, that's why I said a while ago, I don't think most of us know how progressive this is, and this is a wake-up call. So it's okay. I'll take the blame. Um, uh, if I have to go somewhere for a while, maybe the Bahamas would be good. I'll go, <laughs> go to there afterwards pretty quickly. But all of this said, all of the, the progression that they've made does not impress God one iota or change His Ten Commandment law. He cannot and will not change it for you or me or the LGBTQ movement or anyone else. Now, in 2015, with the help of then-President Barack Obama, same-sex marriage was instituted by the federal government of the United States of America to become law of the land. And with all of that, with all their earthly successes for promoting their lifestyle and agenda, they cannot, I'm going to say it again, they cannot, and I emphasize, change one jot or tittle of God's law. Amen. Is that clear? Amen. God will not allow... 
God will not allow sin or sinners in rebellion to his law to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So please listen closely. We're not talking about a group who stumble and fall from time to time and, and, and then come back to the foot of the cross. No. We're talking about a group who denies they're living in sin. And they want you and me to buy into it. They're bringing their junk into the church, right? I'm doing it again. So therefore, there's no need to ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins. And guess what? As I already said, they have every right to believe what they want to about sin. But we as a church cannot allow deception to chip away at the law of God. Amen. Are we together on that? Amen. We Christians have committed to uphold the law of God. Now, it doesn't make any difference how much earthly support they have. They do not have God's support. No one will be in heaven. Now, I'm talking about everybody, not just them. Open rebellion. No one will be in heaven without repentance and forgiveness. It's that simple. It's biblical. I'm telling you the truth. This is not a judgment call by me personally or anyone else. This is a thus saith the Lord. Repentance, listen to this. Maybe I can coin this. Repentance and forgiveness was incorporated into the plan of salvation from the foundation of the world. Think about that. Repentance and forgiveness was incorporated into the plan of salvation. That gives me chills. From the foundation of the world. Let's go, let's go quickly. 2 Chronicles 7.14. And some of you can just quote it with me. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's a promise that God has given to you and me. Why do we think about acquiescing or, or, or diluting or being afraid to say what God has given? Given us this, he's given us a message, especially those of us that call ourselves a remnant church. He's given us a message to give into all the world. Fear God and give glory to him. Not, oh, let's have, an, let's have a graduation and tell them how much we affirm them. That's what we should not be doing. If you love them, you won't do that. If you love them, you will tell them the truth regardless how they take it. Because it's not for us to decide. It's between them and and the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, brothers and sisters, what an incredible promise from God, but the scripture makes it clear that we humans bring on our own demise by our own bad decisions. And that's when we make them against God's laws. So now, I'm back to let me address adultery. Because people say, why do you just pick on them? I realize some of you are saying, he's not preaching enough about adultery. It's just all one group of people. Well. Let me say this plain out. I'm going to look to you at home here. Adultery also is a sexual sin. And it is listed under the seventh commandment as well. Now, adultery is also built on lust and is not of God. So I might as well answer that question as it's a good one. As we already discussed, any sin can be forgiven. Each person has to choose to want forgiveness or not. Denying our sinful acts and pretending they're not sins will not fool God. Amen. That's the difference. If I'm an adulterer or if I'm in an LGBTQ lifestyle, for me to deny sins, that's not going to get me anywhere. Well, get me somewhere, but not where I want to go. <laughs> right? I do believe some sins are more harmful to the body of Christ than others. This movement has declared war on Christianity by their mission to indoctrinate our young children with lies about the sin of homosexuality. And many of our government and even church leaders support them openly or by their silence. Now, if they succeed in this war, the church of God on this earth will be adversely affected for generations to come. Right? Should the Lord tarry? Well, while we agree adultery is a sin, there is not an organized army of people in high places of influence pushing their agenda on the church to affirm the sin of adultery as normal attraction to the opposite sex. See what, see what I'm saying? They're not, everybody's in adultery, they're hiding around. They're not coming out trying to force, hey, I'm an adulterer, and I will, oh, whoops, my wife heard that. I didn't aim for that to happen. No, no, nobody's out there 
trying to make the church accept them and affirm. Well, why don't you affirm me? No, they're not doing that because they know they're living in sin. They don't have any literature that I'm aware of in public schools encouraging underage students to fornicate with other students of the opposite sex or any educational books like we just saw encouraging young people to switch their biological gender from birth to the opposite sex. Same goes for other open sins. You don't see an army of alcoholics. They're not out here. You're going to accept, quit preaching about alcoholism. Nobody's out there. The government's not made any laws to, to help and support and promote them. Our churches won't, won't accept that. Or there's no thieves or liars demanding that I know of, groups demanding the church stop preaching on their sinful vices and take them out of the sin category and placing them in the normal or affirm that word again category. None of these other groups are demanding that the church affirm their open sins. Why? Because they know they're sinning against God. Now here's the good news. As long as someone knows he's sinning against God, there's always hope. There's hope for repentance, confession, and forgiveness. Sin is sin is sin. It's not this is such a horrible sin. It's so much worse than all that. No. It's the fact that they're deceived into believing it is not sin. Because... Their, their, their emotions, their perverted lust blinds their eyes from the truth. That's why, folks, it's up to you and me, the church, to set the record straight on behalf of our Creator God. After all that being said, is adultery a sin? Yes, it is. Just the same as breaking any of the other nine commandments. I just want that to be clear. Now, you're not going to like this, some of you, but now while I'm on a roll, I can't close this sermon without, without identifying blasphemy also applies when any church affirms abortion. All right, you're getting quiet. I'm shutting down for a couple minutes here, a few minutes. Okay. Again, the church cannot attempt to affirm abortion for the same reasons as listed above for the LGBTQ people. It's the principle of the sin that we're dealing with. Anytime the church affirms abortion, which is straight up murder, she was attempting to sit on the throne room of God. Folks, this is a serious business. Abortion should never come to a vote as a church because we cannot vote to kill innocent babies no more than they can, we can forgive their sins, right? Did you know that not one baby, get this, not one baby is conceived out of wedlock? Now, it may be conceived what I should say with God's blessings, not one baby is conceived out of wedlock. It may be conceived through rape and incest, but still, think about it, only God, only God can create life. So no matter how it comes about, no matter how it comes about, it's still God. So we don't have a right to vote on as a church, and I know there are people wanting to vote on this. There's no, we don't have a right to vote on abortion. That's God's business. We're not going to sit in the place of God, right? Satan cannot create, create another human being. But God in his love for fallen man still turns the seed of human beings into human life. All life is infinitely valuable and is from God. But once again, I must say, it is not in the church's authority to forgive sins. That is God's business. Plus, as plainly as I can say it, God loves the sinners but he hates the sin. If God cannot and will not affirm open sin, then how dare any Christian church slap God in the face by claiming to affirm open sin? We should never consider acquiescing or compromising God's law. Can anyone show me any new light discovered on this Bible subject? I'd be open to that, but we won't. The Christian church here in America today has really put themselves behind the eight ball. Can I use that term in church? I guess it's all right. There's no gambling on it. We're just playing eight ball, that's all. <clears throat> Why? Because it shows the world our hypocrisy. We live by the Bible and the Bible only, sola scriptura, right? Unless, 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 of course, we're pressured by present day social culture or the government. That makes us look very hypocritical, and, and we are at times. Then we'll, need, we'll bow our knee to bell. But other than that, when things are going good, we're not going to bow our knee to bell, just when times get tough. 
That's basically why people don't respect so many Christians. Now recently I watched some videos from the Washington Adventist University, the Sligo SDA Church, of some conferences recently held in March of 2022. Now from what I watched, all the presenters and panel guests supported the acceptance of LGBTQ members and leaders in the Adventist Church. These were not just students. These speakers included a variety of pastors and professors and even a chaplain from Loma Linda. I would suggest you look up these videos. You can look them up online while they're still available. They may take them down after this. But some of you might be very shocked. because I believe that every season, Christian knows down deep in your heart that homosexual lifestyle is wrong. We, every, every, we know that same-sex marriage is wrong. We know adultery is wrong. So I want to bring in these other, we know that down deep in our heart. Yet, think about it. We know that in our heart, yet we will compromise over and over and over and over again. The murdering of innocent babies, and this is such a solemn, such a, it really hits my heart and many of you too. The murdering of innocent babies is also a sin and an abomination to God. Yet, many of us Christians will go on social media defending these sins because, in truth, you're trying to defend your politics. Now, as Christians, we should be carrying the Christian flag of truth, honoring God, right, and defending His character of life and love. Now, you can get angry with me and attack me personally and accuse me of all sorts of things, and some of it may be true, but praise God, I'm a forgiven, repentant sinner, saved by grace. How about you? Amen. All right. Now, that's the beauty of God's grace. You don't have to be a rocket scientist spiritually to understand that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. Personal attacks against me or anyone else will not change the fact no one will ever be a part of God's remnant church who supports these open sins against Him. I can say this with authority because they are breaking the sixth and seventh commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that's all of them, right? Yes. All right. I will challenge any of you to send me any Bible text that support two men or two women having sex and marrying with God's blessings. Now, don't get upset at me just because you don't like what I'm saying. Just send me text proving that God supports homosexual relationships. And feel free to send me any text. Really, this is a bad one. Give me any text proving that God puts his blessings on a man dressing and acting as a woman, and vice versa. It won't happen. You know what? It's the same with abortion. You cannot make God out to contradict his own word. He says, thou shalt not murder. We know that babies in the womb are real live human beings. <clears throat> so you cannot justify murdering them with God's blessings. If you claim the Christian, right, the name Christian, and you support these open attacks against God's character of love, then I suggest that you do some self-evaluation as you may already be deceived. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12. Everybody's getting quiet, I understand. <laughs> and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them what? strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the but had pleasure in <clears throat> I didn't say that the Bible said it this scripture has never been more apropos than today I'm going to give you one more scripture 1 Corinthians 6 9 hopefully it's up on yeah it is read it with me Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, what does the word effeminate mean? Well, I just went to the dictionary to see. I thought I knew. But the dictionary answer is, quote, with reference to a man having characteristics and ways of behaving traditionally associated with women and regarded as inappropriate for a man. Now, have you seen the transgender pretending to be a, a, a woman on the Bud Light commercial? Yeah, he looks and acts like more feminine than most women do. I think the same guy is doing the Nike commercial. Now, these are great examples of effeminate. 
Any transgender man pretending to be a woman is definitely effeminate. Now, what does the scripture mean when it says, because we just read, abusers of themselves with mankind? Now, this and a number of other scriptures are referring to men bedding with men and can even include sodomy. Leviticus 18, 22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. I didn't say that. God said that. And get this, many doctors now claim they're not able to tell a baby's gender at birth, <laughs> right? And some doctors are supportive of removing trans transgenderism from the mentally ill category. Now, I don't care how you slice it, folks. Anytime a man dresses as a woman and identifies as a woman, he has a mental illness. We should be helping him. We should not be affirming him. Anyone who affirms a transgender honestly should be ashamed of themselves. If you're a Christian, you should be ashamed of yourself. All right, moving on. We've been talking about open sin. Let's talk about the sin that we Christians don't want to do, but we find ourselves in a struggle between good and evil. And sometimes we fail to do. We don't want to just do all the stuff on open sin because we all sin and come short of the glory of God. So we're all guilty of sin. So we fit into the open sin or we fit into this other sin that we don't, well, Paul tells us about it. Let's look in Romans 9, uh, Romans 7, 19 to 25. I'll just read this and through quickly. Okay. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So. What Paul is describing is a struggle that we all have. It's a warring between the spirit and flesh. Now, folks, do you see the difference between open rebellion of God's laws versus a Christian struggle with the flesh, right, as we travel down life's highway? You see the difference now? It's that we don't want to do it, but we do, and we have to come back to Jesus because we have spiritual sense enough to know it is a sin. So we can't get forgiveness unless we confess that sin and ask God and repent of it and ask God to forgive us. So when I don't do that, then he can't forgive me. There's some things God can't do. So yes, the difference is it's the forgiveness factor. All right? Now, if I acknowledge my sin, and this is going to be walk you down here. If I acknowledge my sin and confess it to God, he forgives it. Simple so far, right? So it is no longer a sin. If I don't confess to God and don't ask forgiveness, then it is unforgiven sin. So let me ask, can I go to heaven if I celebrate, now listen, if I celebrate my sin and refuse to be sorry and refuse to confess my sins to God? No. The answer is a resounding, what you just said, no, right? One, no one, let me say this again, no one will meet the Lord in the air on Judgment Day who's lived a lifestyle contrary to the Word of God. This is anybody. We're not talking about this one group. For all of us, like Paul, who are sinners in spite of ourselves, for all of us who petition God to forgive us our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, as we already read. Homosexuals can be saved after they confess their sins. I hope that nobody's offended by that because why should they be saved in their sin and not the rest of us? Right? I mean, why are they saved and not the rest of us in our sin? Because God doesn't forgive us in our sins, save us in our sins. He saves us from our sins. Okay, just the same as an adulterer can be saved after he confesses his sins and God's church should be there to welcome them and nurture them. Same goes for women who struggle through abortion. They need our love and support. Amen. Hey, once it's done, we have no right to try and put these women on a guilt trip. They know what they've done. God's earthly church should be a hospital for sinners, 
a haven for those needing to be loved during their ups and downs of life, and a place to come to for health and healing and peace of mind. It's not a place for perfect saints or they'd have no members, right? As a church, we are to love one another. It's not our job or responsibility to continually point out other people's failures. We cannot spend our time judging. Now you're going to say, uh oh, you're getting yourself in trouble. We cannot spend our time judging others who are not as good a Christians as we think we are. Turn with me on this one. Matthew 7, 1 to 5 says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Now this is getting deep here. Let me ask you. Somebody's going to say, or they may ask me, may ask you later, okay? After reading those verses, why would you judge? Danny, why would you judge groups such as the LGBTQ groups? Doesn't the Bible say we're not to judge? Now I'm going to jump on the other side for a minute. Oh, absolutely. I'm on the other side. It says you can't judge. In fact, 1 Samuel, let's look at it quickly, 16, 7 says, it confirms why we are not to judge a person's what part of him? his heart. Because this scripture says it all. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the So, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot judge a person's heart. Now, I'm going to talk honest, very honestly here, straightforward with you, I should say. I hope I've been honest the whole service, but talk straightforward with you. Have you ever met a person that your very first thought when you see him is, wow, he looks like an alcoholic or a drug addict? <laughs> now, I'm just being honest. It may be true that this person may appear to be someone who has abused his body with alcohol and drugs for many years. But not knowing the individual, I don't have any right to judge him. It's possible that he was a former alcoholic or drug abuser, but now is a Christian. He's found victory through Jesus Christ. I may even see this man drunk, lying in a gutter, and I still cannot judge his heart. Why? Because I'm looking on the outward appearance. He may love Jesus, but just suffered a setback on his Christian journey, as we each and every one of us do. Instead of judging him, I should reach out to him in compassion and love. It may mean the difference in his eternal life or mine and yours, right? Okay, follow me now. All that said, we do, however, have the right and responsibility as Christians to judge good fruit from bad fruit. Matthew continues a few verses later. Matthew 7, 16 to 18. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corruptible tree bringeth forth evil fruit. What kind? And a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So here it is. Is Matthew contradicting himself? Or how can we reconcile both of these scriptures? They're from the same Bible writer, taken from the same chapters. Are we able to reconcile these or not? Well, let's try. Follow me, please. Now, if the same man that we just discussed claimed to be a Christian and celebrated the fact that he abuses his own body through the use of drugs and alcohol and demands that your church affirm him and his lifestyle by voting him into membership and ordaining him as an elder, do you think your church would do that? No, no they wouldn't. Okay. Of course not. Why not? Because he is transgressing, openly transgressing God's health laws. Ordaining him as an elder would speak to all the youth that abusing your body through drugs and alcohol is an acceptable lifestyle for the Christian. At this point, listen closely, you did not judge his heart. You judged his bad fruit. This is righteous judgment, which John talks about in John 7, 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now, somebody tell me, please, this makes some sense. Does this make any spiritual sense? Okay. Now, the first example, we have no right to judge a man's heart. 
Only God can do that. In our second example of the same man, we can base our judgment on his bad fruit. For, okay, for those of you still looking at me like a deer in headlights, as they say, <laughs> let me try something you'll get, all right? Some of you didn't get that. Let's try this. Okay, let's say you look through the front door, and as you look through the peephole, you see a man standing there with a gun pointed in your direction. Now you're faced with a decision. Do you open the door or not? Now, you could reason that maybe he's just there wanting to sell you some Boy Scout cookies, right? <laughs> Or does your common sense kick in and you make a quick decision based on the bad fruit he is pointing your way and call 911? All right, as a church, it's our responsibility spiritually to call 911 when we see bad fruit approaching the church doors. Right? That's why I said we're not on the offense, we're on the defense. We're protecting the church. When this community is demanding that we affirm open, outright sin in the name of Christianity, inclusion, equity, race, diversity, and politics, and when their teachings mislead others away from the Word of God, we can and should counteract the counterfeit. Amen. By their fruits we can know them. The devil knows his time is short, as in John 10:10, 10, 10, he, he says he's out to steal, kill, and to destroy. Remember, the devil is the real enemy. It's not the people. This should be a wake-up call to pastors and members and literally everywhere. I'm amazed we have so many of our preachers who are so busy preaching about a coming National Sunday Law that they seem oblivious to the threat, the biggest threat, I believe, to destroy the Christian church since the Dark Ages. Now, prophecy is great, right? But it was never given to take the place of present truth. Uh-oh, somebody said, well, this is present truth. Well, what do I mean by that statement? The present truth is this. The church of God is right now under attack by the devil to do, he's literally there to divide and destroy God's remnant church. Now, some of my pastor friends will be crying out that we should be looking for a national Sunday law as the big sign of end time prophecy instead of being so concerned about abortion and same sex marriage. In fact, I've had a couple of them tell me that already. And maybe technically, I won't argue with them, but, and the big but, that didn't sound good, the but <laughs> is this. Let me get you back for a second now, so, <laughs> all right. The devil knows if he can divide and confuse the church on these issues right now, our people will already be so compromised to the point that they will fall like dominoes when it comes time to stand up against for a national Sunday law or any other end time event. Am I right? <laughs> Folks, this threat is real and it's imminent with deep-seated demonic roots. Brothers and sisters, the church is in trouble, and Satan has convinced way too many to remain silent. All the while, he uses this community to attack the law of God. Quietly, mums the word. Well, let me ask you, if a known prostitute was wanting to join your church and be a deaconess while continuing to walk the street out in front of your church, I imagine you'd break your silence and have something to say about that, right? If the town drunk was wanting to join your church and be a deacon or elder and still openly indulge, I don't imagine you'd be so quiet about expressing your opposition. Or what about an individual or a group wanting to join your church, though they're preaching and teaching that the Sabbath can be any day of the week that you choose, including Sunday? At this point, I doubt you would be too quiet or worry about this thing of inclusion and diversity and all of that. Am I right? Oh, no, we get in Adventist church. We think that's everything, right? We're not going to let this happen. Folks, we have to say no to any attempts to affirm open sin by the church, against the church, or within the church. The longer we stay quiet and on any open sin in the church, the more the doors open wider for Satan to deceive even the very elect. Now, as Adventists, we're great at preaching the principle when it comes to keeping the Sabbath. I'm going to talk real to you here in closing, right? But if we as a church are willing to accept LGBT community as leaders and members of the church, then why bother to defend the keeping of the seventh-day Sabbath? Why not affirm any day or every day as the Sabbath, right? I mean, think about it. If you're willing to throw out the sixth and seventh commandments out the window, then why bother on keeping the fourth? Why not go ahead and throw it out as well? Come on, folks. <laughs> we Christians must understand 
that anyone in rebellion knows he's in rebellion or he's refused the truth so long. Remember the scripture we read a while ago, God let us believe a lie? You don't have to believe, oh, you, I don't think you believe that can happen to you. I don't think we, we think we can be deceived. A lot of us don't. Well, let me tell you something. It happened to a third of all the angels in heaven who were communing with God every day. They didn't think they could be deceived, I'm sure. They fell for Satan's lies and it cost them their eternal life. I'm pretty sure many of them saw no harm in just being silent about it. But that's not the way it turned out, right? In closing, I wish I could tell you that the church you see today is the remnant church, is the remnant church that Jesus is coming back to receive. But we are not. I'm sorry to say that we're not. But I do believe, and I'm convinced, there is already, maybe we didn't know about it, but there is already, the shaking has started, and that's a good thing. And the remnant church will be the ones still hanging on to the tree of life, that's hanging on to Jesus after the big shaking. And they're described in Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Don't you wanna be one of those brothers and sisters? If you're not even committed and bold enough to take a stand for truth now, you will, you'll deny Christ in the, right? You won't make it to the hard times. I mean, think, if we deny him now, we cannot make it during the time of trouble. The blood-bought remnant church will gladly defend all 10 commandments of God. They will defend, defend them with their very lives if necessary. Think about it. How many people will give their lives for a cause they don't even love? Let me ask you. If you find yourself affirming abortion, LGBTQ, or any other open sin, are you really in a position to make it through the time of trouble? No. The Bible tells us that Jesus is coming back. Amen. And guess who's going to take to heaven with him? Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. You know it by heart. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It didn't say just some of them. So you can justify ignoring the fourth commandment, the sixth commandment, seventh commandment, or any of the others. But the devil's tactic today has been the reshaping of the church into quiet compromise. That's deep. I better say it again. The devil's tactics today is the reshaping of the church into quiet, thank you, compromise. It's time to cry aloud. Forget being quiet, right? Spare not. Sadly, the big counterfeit for many SDA Christians is that most of us seem to think they stand, when we stand up for the fourth commandment, they're standing up for all of them. That's just not true. Our loyalty must be to God. It's past time that we stand up for the cause of Christ in this spiritual battle. As we're, we're on one side or the other, folks, there is no middle ground. I can tell you that Jesus never affirmed open sin when he walked on this earth, or he's not now affirming open sin where he's now ever interceding at the right hand of the Father for you and me. Isn't that incredible he would do that? So it's only when we submit and commit our lives to Jesus that he can use us as a vessel of honor. Our only hope is built on Jesus Christ and his love for fallen man. 